I'm Jason Hartman, and I'd like to invite you to our very first two-day conference in beautiful Hawaii. Many of our attendees are making a vacation out of this event. You will learn the most innovative strategies for real estate investing available today. We have helped thousands of people invest in properties around the U.S., and we can help you do it too. So I hope you'll join us, and happy investing. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the AIPIS show for accredited income property investment specialists and those who aspire to be. If you're a real estate, mortgage, or financial professional, this is the place for you. We'll explore innovative investment analysis, sales, marketing, and income generating strategies for the most historically proven wealth creator, income property. Learn from the experts as they show you how to build a better business and a better life. Welcome to the show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, and every 10th episode, we do something kind of special, kind of different. What we do is we go off topic. So regardless of which show it is on the Hartman Media Network, whether it be one of the financial shows, economics, real estate investing, travel, longevity, all of the other topics that we have, every 10th episode, we go off topic and we explore something of general interest, something of general life success value. And so many of our listeners around the world in 164 countries have absolutely loved our 10th episode shows. So that's what we're going to do today. And let's go ahead and get to our guest with a special 10th episode show. And of course, on the next episode, we'll be back to our regular programming. Here we go. It's my pleasure to welcome Stephen E. Landsberg. He is a professor of economics at the University of Rochester. He's the author of several books, including the latest one, Can You Outsmart an Economist? Also, More Sex is Safer Sex, The Big Questions, and the hugely popular Armchair Economist, among others. Stephen, welcome. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. Good. It's good to have you. You've also written for Forbes, Slate, and the Wall Street Journal, and uh, you really cover some interesting stuff. Can people outsmart an economist? Uh, some people can, and I, I guess some, <laughs> all people can some of the time, and some people can a lot of the time. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone can all the time. Economists sometimes outsmart themselves, too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, good way to put it. So it seems like the basic premise of your work there is to get people to think like an economist and reason in, in that way, but applying that to all sorts of different areas of life, right? Absolutely. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay, great. Well, give us some examples. Well, and Can You Outsmart an Economist is a book of, it's about 100, 150 actually, little puzzles and brain teasers, which when you confront them, uh, end up teaching you a little something about how economists think or how to think about the real world. For example, um, there's a puzzle, and this is based on a real world situation at Berkeley. Berkeley, uh, as of a few years ago, were admitting to its graduate schools 46% of their male applicants and 30% of their female applicants. Question is, what can you conclude from that about discrimination? On the surface, it looks pretty bad. If you get down into the details, it turns out that women, to a tremendous extent at Berkeley, for one reason or another, apply disproportionately to the most selective departments. Mm -hmm. And if you break this down department by department, most departments at Berkeley actually accept more women than men proportionally. Mm -hmm. But it's it's just that women are shooting higher is what you're women saying. Women are shooting higher. So, women so when, are sh when you shoot higher, you're going to get more rejections, obviously, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Women are shooting for the medical school and men are shooting for the English department as mm -hmm. it happens at Berkeley. Interesting. And so that you can explain those numbers away. Uh, not only can you explain them away, but uh, uh, the deeper you go into the numbers, the clearer it becomes that that's the full explanation. Yeah, I think in, in so many ways, uh, all of this talk about racial discrimination, gender discrimination, when you really 
actually think, which is not a popular thing nowadays. A lot of these things have uh, very good explanations, but in the world of political correctness, you can't even talk about this stuff without someone yelling at you. So uh, the truth gets uh, put under the rug many times, doesn't it? There are quite a few examples in the book where the uh, the statistics fool you into seeing discrimination where there is none. There are also a few examples where the statistics can fool you into not seeing discrimination where there is some. Right, right. And, and I don't deny that that exists. I'm just saying to the proportion that it's discussed in the mainstream, <laughs> it doesn't exist that much (laughs) you know so yeah and there's also a um one of my favorite examples in the book asks this you know we often hear that women are paid something like 77 percent of what men are paid for doing similar work Uh if that's true then why wouldn't wouldn't companies just hire all women yeah it's why wouldn't they hire all women right right. now that's a very easy thing to say you'd think they would hire all women i I mean if you can pay them 23 i'd love to cut my cost in my company by 23 percent I'd just have a complete female workforce. That'd be a great deal. Absolutely. Now, what I want to say is you're right, but a critic could come back and say, okay, so you'd save some money, but how much would you really save? Mm -hmm. I've got a little section in the book, a little puzzle where it leads you through actually doing the calculation Mm -hmm. and you discover that you could probably raise your stock price by about 50% overnight if you did this. So the effect is huge. The effect is absolutely huge. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine that that somebody would turn away a profit opportunity like that. So again, I applaud your reasoning, which turns out to be exactly right. But I wanted to go a step further and say, okay, here's this argument we're making. Let's actually put some numbers in there and see if the argument still holds up. And it Mm -hmm. turns out when you put the numbers in, the argument just ends up getting even stronger than you thought it was. Right, right. Well, maybe we can circle back to that. But you've got so many uh, things here that's interesting. Give us another example from your latest latest book about outsmarting an economist, if you would. Here's one. Suppose I put a price ceiling on wheat. I control the price of wheat. Okay. What happens to the price of bread? Okay. It, now, should, you might it should go up, say, right? Oh, no, it shouldn't go up, right? You might be tempted to say, look, wheat is an input to bread. Right. We hold down the price of wheat. That makes it cheaper to make bread. The price of bread should go down. Exactly the opposite, because you're going to create a shortage of wheat. Mm-hmm. You're going to create a shortage of wheat. That means there's going to be less bread produced. And if there's less bread produced, the price is going to go up, right. not down. This is you know, why central planning doesn't work. It always fails. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, good point. And in fact, there's a whole series of problems near the end of the book where I sort of put you in the position and I say, suppose you're a central planner. Here are some problems. How would you solve these problems? And in going through the solutions, I like to think it's a very clear explanation of why it is impossible for central planners to get these problems right. Every time you think you have allocated resources correctly, there's always some bit of information that you didn't have that threw off your calculations. If you're trying to decide whether it's better to grow tomatoes in California or to grow tomatoes in New York, Mm -hmm. you need to ask yourself, well, where is the land more valuable? The, these tomatoes that I'm growing in California, what would that land otherwise be used for? What would the workers otherwise be doing if they were not growing tomatoes right. in California, if they were not growing tomatoes in New York? Where does the fertilizer come from? What different kinds of fertilizer do you need for the different climates? Where else would the resources that go into making that fertilizer be going? The market does an amazing job of taking account of all that information. If it, there's it a- is incredible. It's truly incredible. The freer the market, the better the information. And the information is what prices things. The, the market prices things by allocating all of those inputs and resources. It's insanely efficient. If you really comprehend that, I mean, it's not perfect by any means. There are distortions, especially when government and, you know, regulation gets involved, but it's incredibly efficient. I mean, it really is. It's a modern miracle, you know? Yes. And again, I I do have this little series of puzzles where you are led over and over to believe that you've got all the relevant information and and the answer is clear. But time after time, there's always some additional piece of information where once it's pointed out to you, you realize, yes, I would need that information also. Yes, I would need that other information also. But it goes on forever. Mm -hmm. No individual and no central planner is ever going to have all the relevant information for making allocation decisions. And yet the market does 
does manage to account for all that information because all of it's reflected in prices. Yeah, it really, really is. It truly, it's a modern marvel. It really is. And, you know, capitalism existed thousands of years ago, too, and it, it was a miracle then. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting, and let me know if you cover it in the book at all, because you've got chapters about backward reasoning, uh, knowledge. Are you smarter than Google? One of the scariest companies on Earth, if you ask me. <laughs> Facebook being maybe number two, but uh, certainly very smart company at the same time. You talk about law school admissions, and maybe you touched on that with the Berkeley example, I'm not sure. Life and death matters, the coin flippers dilemma, etc. This is all interesting, and then, you know, money, trade, and finance. But, you know, one of the things I commonly talk about, and I find that just people miss over and over again in so many areas of life, in the political arena, in economics, and in investing, is the concept that you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. And it sounded like we were almost alluding to that idea a moment ago. You know, there's a profound impact in things that are unseen and things that don't happen. Because the question we always have to ask ourselves is, what might have happened if we did it differently? And we don't know that. We don't have any example of that, usually. And it requires some out-of-the-box thinking, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a huge part of what I try to convey to my students in the classroom. Tell us more about that, if you would. Can you elaborate on that idea? It's so easy, for example, to think that you can raise employment by having the government hire people. Mm -hmm. What you're overlooking is that when the government hires people, they've got to pay them and the money's got to come from somewhere. Right. Where does it come from? Well, maybe they raise my taxes. They raise my taxes so I don't build that swimming pool I was going to build and mm -hmm. we just put a pool builder out of work. Right. Or maybe they borrow some money from you and because they borrow some money from you, you don't put that money in the bank and the bank makes one less loan and some business does not expand the way they intended to. This, I think, is what you were getting at yeah, with, right. with hidden things, things we don't see. Minimum wage is a great example. Example, you know, when you raise the minimum wage by fiat, you naturally increase the unemployment rate, usually among the most tender people, minorities, uh, young people that can create more crime if they're not working and doing something productive, you know, because crime is usually a younger person's thing. <laughs> you know, I, idle time is the devil's workshop, as the old saying goes. Yeah, it, it's just amazing how the, this you have this follow on effect, this processional effect of all all these, all these things that uh, are sort of legislated, it, it usually uh, creates a disaster. Well, since you mentioned the minimum wage, I mean, I think uh, this is a particular striking thing here in that we have an alternative policy that does the same thing, you know, raises the wages of low paid workers without discouraging employment, and that's the earned income tax credit. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue about whether the earned income tax credit is good policy or not, okay. but it's certainly better policy than the minimum wage. It does everything the minimum wage does in terms of getting the effective wages of these people higher, and it does it without discouraging employment. In fact, it encourages employment. Okay. So the EITC, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. We can argue about that, but it is so much better than the minimum wage that it makes no sense to even think about using the minimum Explain the mechanics of that. So explain the mechanics of the earned income tax credit. Tell us about that. The earned income tax credit basically says that if you have a job and you earn $12 an hour, the government will kick in another three to get your wage up to $15. Okay, so what happens? What is the result of this? The result of this is that effectively... We've created the effect of a minimum wage. We've raised your wage from $12 to $15. The extra three is coming from the government, not from the employer. Uh -huh. And we've done it without giving the employer an incentive to fire you, which the minimum wage does. Right, right. Why is there such a constituency for the minimum wage? I suspect it's because people have convinced themselves that the minimum wage is somehow free, that it doesn't cost anybody yeah, anything. I know. <laughs> it's an irony. Yeah. You will hear people say, well, we can't have the earned income tax credit because it's costly. It's going to come out of taxpayers' pockets. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the minimum wage payments come from? They mm -hmm. also come from people's pockets and yeah. largely the same people. I in fact, largely from low-income people because minimum wages are paid at places like McDonald's and Walmart and Target, right. which serve a lot of poor people. You start raising minimum wages at those places, those places are going to contract those are the places that poor people rely on to do a lot of their shopping. So the minimum wage hits 
poor people, whereas the earned income tax credit comes out of general tax revenues, it hits the population at, at large. That's another reason. Right, right. And you didn't even have to mention inflation, the effect of inflation, the idea that businesses are just passed through entities. It's not like the executives agree to take a pay cut when all of this stuff happens. They just raise prices and pass it through or they contract or they automate. There are so many reactions to these things. It's just funny that politicians, they get up there and talk. I mean, I'll pick on Bernie Sanders for a moment. You know, he gets up there and talks as though the market isn't going to react to his ideas. Of course, the market reacts. You can see it in California. You know, I mean, you live in New York City uh, or well, you live in Rochester. Sorry, you live in New York. But you can see these states that have the high regulatory burden give people an incentive to leave. You know, people just vote with their feet, don't they? They do. And, uh, you know, I think we've seen substantial increases in that effect just over the last few years. There's a lot of migration across states that is uh, pretty clearly due to, to regulatory things. In the other direction, there are a lot of regulations that really make it hard to move across states, particularly mm-hmm. with occupational licensing. You're licensed yes, to be yes. a beautician mm-hmm. in New York. Yep. You, you want to move to Connecticut. You can't because your license is no good. I, I love that you mentioned that. I call that the economic Berlin Wall. And what states with high tax burdens and high regulatory burdens, they seem to now, I this is just anecdotal, what I'm about to say, they seem to have no reciprocity deals on professional licenses, real estate licenses, the bar associations for lawyers, teacher credentials, massage therapists, hairstylists, cosmetologists, etc. You're right. That's exactly what they do. So California, my home state for many years, there's just no reciprocal deals, right? If you get a like my real estate license in California isn't good anywhere else, right? Yet, if you get a real estate license in many other low burden states, they will have reciprocal deals where you can just sit for the exam in another state rather than having to take all the classes, right? That'll be the example. That's how they keep you in. They, you're stuck because it's very hard to go do it again in another state. So that's the economic Berlin Wall. And it's huge. I I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but I did look at them very recently. And it was something like for every thousand people who move across state borders, there are another 300 who would have moved if it had not had an impact on their professional licensing. Wow. So, uh, you know, it it really is a huge burden on people. Obviously, Mm -hmm. people want to move for all kinds of reasons to be closer to their families or because a spouse got a better job or something. And it's a huge burden on people not to be able to do that. Absolutely. Stephen, uh, before the show, I mean, you've got a, one book with a, a rather inflammatory title. <laughs> Let's talk about sex. Uh, your book, More Sex is Safer Sex, The Unconventional Wisdom of Economics. Tell us about this. Let's start with this. It's a general principle of economics in every economics class. If people do not feel the consequences of their own actions, then they tend to behave badly. If you own a factory and you can put pollution into the air, which everybody else has to breathe, and if there's no penalty for that, right. you will put too much pollution in the air. Sure. Likewise, if you happen to be a very reckless, promiscuous person who, because of your past behavior, you're very likely to be infected with something terrible. And when I say you here, of course, this is some generic you. I don't mean you personally. Right. Right. And by the way, I just saw an article about that last week. STDs are really on the rise in the U.S. So this absolutely promiscuity problem is is serious. (laughs) If you are that person, you are a polluter. You are making the world less safe for other people. You're Mm -hmm. uh, the pool in which everybody else is uh, fishing for partners is a less clean pool pool if, when you get into it. Just like a factory polluting a river or polluting the air. Exactly. That, that's, that's really interesting. You know, I never thought of it that way. And economists call that externalities, right? The it's externalities exact, they're producing. It, it's an externality. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly analogous yeah. to the firm polluting the air. And on basic economic principles, we know we get too much of it. Those people who are already promiscuous are too promiscuous. They're mm-hmm. having too many partners. Right. But the surprising flip side of that The surprising flip side of that is that if you are a person who is particularly safe and particularly unlikely to be infected with things, well, when you jump into that pool, that's like reverse pollution. You are making it a safer place for everybody else who's fishing. Mm -hmm. The person who goes home with you tonight, if you're a very safe person, has just been rescued from the prospect of going home with somebody dangerous. So the people who are habitually very safe and very cautious – When they take new partners, they are actually anti-polluters. 
And on the same principle, we don't get enough of that. There are not enough people out in the parks voluntarily picking up trash. And the reason there aren't is that most of the benefits when you go out and pick up trash is that most of those benefits go to somebody other than you. Likewise, if you are a very safe person and you know you're not infected with anything, you go out and find new partners. A lot of the benefits are going to those new partners, not to you. And therefore, you won't have enough of those new partners. Now, we don't want you to have too many because if you have too many, you'll become just like that promiscuous person. And it reverses. That, that's interesting. Right. You know, this is so unfair. I tell you, I am that person. <laughs> I don't have many partners at all. Maybe that's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> I don't know. But I should be getting, I should be entitled to some carbon credits or something. I should get paid Absolutely. for being and the you safer. Should, you should be rewarded. Yeah, but I don't get rewarded. You should be rewarded yeah. for it, and you should be rewarded in particular every time that we get you to take one more partner than you otherwise would have. Uh -huh. You have made the world a safer place for that person, and on pure economic principles, now, of course, you might want to argue there's more than economics involved here, but if you apply the straight principles that we teach in our economics classes, people who go out and voluntarily pick up trash in the parks ought to get rewarded for that. Yeah. And people who are very safe sexually and go out and take a new partner ought to get rewarded for that on exactly the same grounds. <laughs> so you run this through yeah, a model, well. you run this through a, a model that takes account of the things that the epidemiologists know and the things that economists know about the way people respond to incentives. And you discover that if you could take everybody who has fewer than three partners a year and bring them all up to three partners a year, you would actually substantially slow down the spread of STDs. Wow. This is so unfair. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking that I need to require some sort of payment in advance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, that would be illegal in most places, wouldn't it? <laughs> Not only that, but the problem, and here we come back to some real economic issues, too. You can't get payment in advance because nobody knows whether you're telling the truth about being a very safe person. Right. It's hidden. It's hidden from the consumer. The consumer doesn't know. Right. The consumer being the potential partner does not know how safe you are and therefore is not willing to pick up the dinner tab to reward you for your safety. Right. Yeah, well, that's true. So just in theory, what would be a solution for this type of stuff? Like in China, they have this social scoring model. It's like your FICO score, like your credit score for your whole life, which is super scary. They're doing that. And I, I don't know if it includes um, the sexual component or not, but it includes all sorts of other things in, in, you know, in the social world. You know, do you pay your debts, this, that and the other thing? Is there even a solution for this? Well, what economic theory tells me is that, look, if you're a very safe person, I want to reward you for having more partners. Mm -hmm. If you're a very promiscuous person, I don't want to reward you for mm -hmm. having more partners. My problem is I can't tell who's safe and who's promiscuous. The solution, theory tells me, is to find a reward that only the non-promiscuous people care about. Now, I'm not sure what that reward would be. Maybe it's a library card, right? Mm -hmm. In order to get a library card, you got to prove you had a new partner last night. That won't perhaps incentivize the promiscuous people because they're too busy to go to the library anyway, but it might incentivize some of the non-promiscuous people. It's really interesting, but then there gets there comes to a point, it's kind of like the reverse of the concept of diminishing marginal returns, right? It's sort of the flip of that, I think, because... You know, like you said, if the safe person has too many partners, then right. the opposite happens, right? Absolutely. Where, where so is we, that? Like, we want to push them up to three a year. We don't right. want to push them up to 10 a year. <laughs> Interesting. There's an optimization. By the way, I just got to tell you because this, you know, in my real estate business, one of my uh, conferences uh, called Jason Hartman University that we do, we do this portfolio builder game. We have people look at a bunch of properties and they have to optimize the portfolio they want to build. They have a limited amount of resources, limited amount of money, right? And they have to optimize it for certain optimization vectors, right? Do they want to optimize for capital? cash flow, for appreciation, for ease of management, for geographical diversification, etc. And really, this is an optimization conversation, isn't it? Because you go too far, and it goes the other way. You don't go far enough. And it's also bad. That, that's really fascinating. I'd never thought of it this way. Yeah. And of course, it's all fun, because we're talking about sex. In yeah, the but example. it's true in any but area before, of life, right? But exactly. Yeah. It's the point of bringing this up is not just to have an excuse to talk about sex. It's right, that right. It illustrates a lot of ideas about the way 
economists think about incentives, the way economists think about how to reward people, the way economists think about externalities and the effects of externalities and what we can and cannot do to try and get to better outcomes by changing incentives. So there's there's a lot of really serious economics going on sure here. There and sure there are. If we can illustrate it with a fun example, then right. that's all the better. Right. Well, you know, as soon as you mentioned that three-letter word, you get everybody's ears perk up, so... <laughs> You know, we, we will admit to a little bit of sensationalism on the show if it gets people's attention. So that's fine. Before you go, though, do you want to share just a quick other example of how that applies? I mean, it applies in so many areas of, of life, right? But is there anything you want to just share there before you wrap it up? One that I uh, often talk about to various audiences when I'm asked to give talks is population. Does the world have too many people or too few people? Whenever you raise that question, there's always someone who will point out that there's a limit to the number of people the Earth can support. Right. The Malthusian concept. Yeah. That's the person who has not given this question a minute's thought, because we all know that there is such a thing as a limit on the number of people the Earth can support. What we don't know is whether we currently have too many or too few people. That's a separate question. Mm -hmm. If you want to think about whether the world has too many or too few people, the productive way to think about that is the same way you think about whether the world has too much or too little pollution. You look at the incentives faced by the decision makers, and in this case, the decision makers are the parents deciding whether to have a, another child or not. You look at the impact on the world of bringing in another child, and you look in particular at the externalities, the benefits and the costs that are felt by people other than the decision makers. People list all sorts of costs, but they tend to overlook the benefits. That's what I always say. I, I kind of hate this anti-population argument because it views people only as a cost, never a resource. And the fact is, people solve a lot of the world's problems and clean up the world, too. They don't just pollute it. They do both. Yeah. Problems are solved by people. If you remember the old Mary Tyler Moore television show, Oh, sure Ted do. Baxter. Yeah. Ted Baxter was the buffoonish mm -hmm. anchor man on that show. Right. And he said in one episode that he wanted to have 12 children because he was hoping that one of them would grow up to be the person who figures out how to solve the world's overpopulation problem. <laughs> Ted was a lousy anchor man, but he was a good economist. Yeah. Uh, he oh. realized that people solve problems, and the more people you have, the more problems get solved. Right, right. Okay, so is there an optimum number there? I got to just ask you. I know we're going yes, along. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, what's and, the optimum? Uh, you know, what is the optimum? I'm not sure I can give you an exact number, but I think if you read my books, you'll find a lot of useful ways of thinking about how to think about what the optimum is. But more important than that, it doesn't even really matter what the optimum is. Right now, what we want to know is which side of the optimum are we on? Mm -hmm. If the optimum is 10 billion or 12 billion or 15 billion, we don't need to know that. All we need to know is that the current 7 billion is too few, or perhaps that the current 7 billion is too many. The question to focus on, what I really want to say, is that the important question is not what's the right number. The important question is, which side of the right number are we currently on? And mm -hmm. that requires less thinking than actually trying to zero in on a correct number. Right. And if you want to know which side of the number we're currently on, then you don't have to think about how many people the earth can support and so on. All you have to think about is the incentives faced by decision makers. And you can do that in a systematic way, which I think is spelled out in several of my books. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. You know, it's almost like saying, look, we look around the world and we realize we have a lot more work to do and we haven't solved all our problems yet. So we need more resources. We need to have more people. <laughs> you know, that's like a counterintuitive <laughs> way. Yeah. Really good book is the book, uh, The Bet, that talks about uh, the two opposing schools, you know, what was it? Simon and Ehrlichman or something? I can't remember their names now. Ehrlich. Yeah. Ehrlich. Ehrlich, yeah. They were talking about this and debating this in the public forum in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And, uh, you know, the book is called The Bet. It's, it's quite fascinating. But Stephen, your books are fascinating, too. Give out your website. Tell people where they can find out more. Of course, the books are on Amazon. And the, the newest one is um, Can You Outsmart an Economist, right? Yes. And they can find uh, links to all of my books at thebigquestions.com. My website is thebigquestions.com. Fantastic. Thebigquestions.com. Stephen Landsberg, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Oh, 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 o